Hello, the topic for today is spurious correlation. Uh, spurious correlation is uh, what we refer to when uh, two things are correlated, um, but uh, there's no real reason for it. Um, that is that they are sort of absent some causality. Uh, largely, uh, we're going to be extending uh, our look at causal reasoning because causes are complicated, but they are very important. And so recall from the last time that whenever two things are correlated with each other, uh, that is when they're associated in the, in the sense that where when one of them increases, so does the other, or when one of them increases, the other decreases um, in, in something of a related way. So when they seem to be related in this way, there are four causal possibilities. The first is that A causes B, that is the first thing causes the second. Alternately, the second thing could cause the first. Right? There could be some third thing that causes A and B, that's called underlying causation, or there might be no causation at all, that is the correlation might simply be a coincidence. So for example, uh, if we take a look at this chart here, uh, this is a uh, chart that uh, looks at uh, cigarettes consumed per capita uh, and lung cancer deaths per 100,000 people. Uh, now, of course, one of the things that makes that tricky is that there is a little bit of a gap in time, right, between uh, the somebody's cigarette consumption and, of course, their death due to lung cancer. And so, uh, you know, the, the, there's a bit of a delay in the data. So, like, as smoking really starts to ramp up through the, you know, the through the tens, the twenties, the thirties, the forties, up to its peak in well, right about 1960 to 70, uh, you see that, you know, about about 30 years later, uh, you see that the, uh, the lung cancer deaths start to do the same thing, uh, hitting a peak about in, in about 1990, uh, again, roughly 30 years after uh, the, the sort of you know, peak of cigarette consumption. Um, and so, again, that makes it a little bit difficult. Now, the fact that these two things are so far apart in time does at least help to rule out reverse causation, right? Because, of course, causes don't generally go back in time. Uh, so the idea is that we, we can't say that the lung cancer is causing the cigarette smoking. And it's pretty hard in these kinds of cases to say that some third factor is causing both the lung cancer and the, the smoking. Uh, rather, it seems pretty clear here that it's, it's, it's the... The, the cigarette consumption that causes uh, the lung cancer. Uh, and so, uh, of course, there are also well-known, uh, well, now well-known physical mechanisms uh, that uh, uh, we can use to explain uh, why that happens. Uh, I think probably nobody has read all of those medical studies, at least not the general population. Of course, uh, doctors and researchers have probably read those things, but uh, generally people don't read those sort of things. Uh, but they just sort of, you know, take the, take the, um, the common word for it. Uh, I mean, really, the only thing you have to believe to, to believe this is that inhaling burning stuff into your lungs might not be good for your lungs. Another famous uh, correlation uh, is uh, between uh, mental illness uh, and and also substance abuse and uh, homelessness. Right? These are these are things that have a, a, a remarkable degree of overlap. Um, and in this case, the causal picture is much muddier. Right? It's one of these things where uh, it's very unclear what's really causing what. Uh, and this is one of those cases where you have to be very, very cognizant of uh, the possibility of reverse causation. You might think that it might be mental illness causing homelessness, in which case you want to try and treat the problem by trying to give people better access to mental health care. Right. Well, uh, if that was that that you know, might be a good thing in and of itself, but it might not actually affect homelessness if that's not uh, the major, if it, if the mental health issues are an effect rather than a cause. Same with substance abuse. If substance abuse is an effect rather than a cause uh, of homelessness, well then trying to prevent homelessness by preventing substance abuse might not actually work. Uh, same thing in reverse. If you, if you, uh, uh, if, uh, if it's the uh, uh, substance abuse, for example, that causes the homelessness, well, then trying to prevent substance abuse by preventing homelessness uh, isn't going to work either. And so uh, it's, it's entirely possible that these things may be mutually reinforcing, which would affect how we would try and remediate the problem. Uh, but we really need better data to determine how to try and prevent any of those three problems. And it's, um, it's, it's, it's tricky and it's uh, um, 
of course, very important trying to try and get to the bottom of this. But this is an example where uh, you have to think about poss the possibility of reverse causation. Just because two things are correlated with one another, the causal path that you think seems clear might not actually be the right one. Uh, again, it might be that uh, substance abuse causes uh, uh, homelessness. It might be that homelessness causes substance abuse. It might be that uh, mental illness causes homelessness. It might be that homelessness causes mental illness and, and any number of those things uh, in between. But we do know that they are uh, a rather highly correlated. Likewise, uh, well, one other thing you can do uh, with um, uh, uh, well, with correlation is uh, you can see that the number of people who drowned by falling into a pool uh, correlates fairly well, right, with uh, the number of films that Nicolas Cage appeared in in a given year between 1999 and 2009. Uh, and so the idea is, is that as you see, you know, um, uh, Nicolas Cage appearing in fewer movies, well, so do swimming pool drownings uh, decrease. And of course, uh, if you get all the way up to these, you know, sort of productive years like 2007 for Mr. Cage, uh, of course, we also see a swimming pool drownings really sort of surge. Um, and so uh, honestly, this is one of these arguments for, you know, like uh, just just shut it down, Nick, right? Um, but, uh, you know, not, I have to say I'm not the world's greatest Nicolas Cage fan. And so it's data like this that does uh, sort of, you know, hearten me a little. Um, but um, uh, of course, the correlation is entirely spurious, right? Um, and this is, in fact, uh, from a really great uh, website uh, went made the rounds a few a few years ago. Um, uh, Tyler Vigand, I think, described himself as a, a board graduate student uh, who, you know, put together these, uh, you know, just sort of mined a bunch of data and then found some things that were just randomly correlated with each other, and. Uh, you know, because when you have a big enough, big enough sets of data, some things will coincidentally vary with each other for some period of time. Likewise, um, it looks like uh, we th there's this a uh, very tight correlation. Actually, this correlation is is unusually tight. That's a 99.79. That's 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 serious, right? That's a, a you know. A, very strong correlation, uh, and it, it uh, correlates uh, U.S. spending on science, uh, space, and technology, uh, which you see in this sort of red line here, um, and uh, suicides by hanging, strangulation, and suffocation, right? So uh, that's uh, this black line here. Uh, now, of course, uh, <laughs> if, if, if you, ha you have to think of a causal factor, uh, you know, again, correlation is just not enough. Um, and is it, you know, what could possibly, what explanation could there possibly be for an increase in spending on, 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 on like, you know, space, science and technology and, um, you know, sort of hangings by a very specific method. It, it's, uh, again, the correlation is entirely spurious, even if mathematically uh, it looks pretty good. Uh, there's no reason for thinking that one of those things causes the other, why the other causes the one, why there would be any kind of underlying causation. And so until, you know, until one of those things is something plausible is put forward as a causal factor, uh, coincidence is going to be the best, um, the best way to explain this correlation. So I'd like to... Uh, uh, introduce one more dimension of causal reasoning. So in addition to thinking about correlation, uh, you know, the w why two things would be correlated, uh, also think about whether the cause, uh, whether some things can be correlated because of a cause that's nearby uh, or a cause that's sort of several links removed from what we're looking at. So uh, this is the distinction between a distal cause, okay, this is the cause that is a cause that is several links removed from the effect in question, and a proximal cause, that is the final or intermediate link in a causal chain. So by a causal chain, I mean where one thing causes a second thing, which causes a third thing, which causes a fourth thing, etc. That's a causal chain. So one good example of this is uh, salt consumption, right, tends to cause heart disease, right? But it's not because the salt directly affects the heart in any way, right? So in this case, the salt is a distal cause. What happens is that the salt, uh, higher, you know, higher levels of salt consumption, increase blood pressure, and it's the blood pressure which over time uh, is the is the cause of the wear on, on the heart. So this is one of those things where, again, the salt is the salt consumption is a distal cause of, uh, of uh, heart disease, uh, but not the proximal cause. It's not the immediate cause. Right? And so again, causality is complicated. And so sometimes you have to think of in terms of causal chains, that is of something that causes something else that causes something else that causes something else. 
And so consider something like this, right? Uh, this is a, a, from an article I ran into uh, that was called uh, the least surprising correlation of all time. And uh, basically they, uh, they, they provide this figure here, uh, which graphs uh, uh, test scores on uh, SAT, right? Uh, this, uh, so, you know, again, a standardized uh, high school achievement test um, and uh, break it out in sub scores between the math section, which is in this uh, green line here, uh, the critical reading section, which is in this sort of purple thing here. And then, of course, the writing component, uh, which is this blue line. And of course, they graph that against uh, a family household, in, essentially household income uh, and uh, you know, break it out from sort of least to greatest here. And so what it looks like is that there's a strong correlation between uh, between test scores and family income. That is that uh, students come from uh, uh, richer households tend to score better on these kinds of standardized tests. Um, and uh, it's one of those things where if you were to go out on the street and say, would you believe right, that, um, uh, that uh, kids from rich families are, are scoring better on standardized tests than kids from poor families, uh, people would say, duh, right? Um, it, that, I don't think this would surprise anybody. And in fact, it, it uh, generally doesn't. But of course, what's the explanation here, right? Well, I mean, let's let's uh, be clear about what uh, you know, what kind of causal lessons you might draw from this, and what kinds of causal lessons you can't. Um, one of the uh, uh, one of the the people uh, cited in this particular article uh, said this. He says, um, and that's uh, Greg Mankiw here. He says, suppose we were to graph average SAT scores by the number of bathrooms a student has in his or her family home. That curve would also likely slope upward. That is, more bathrooms, better test scores. After all, people with more money buy larger homes, which again, tend to have more bathrooms, but it would be a mistake to conclude that installing an extra toilet would raise your kids' SAT scores. Okay, again, this is a, a you have to be sort of careful in trying to determine what is actually causal here uh, and what's just a, a phantom of something else. And so let's consider the possibility that um, that uh, uh, you know the money, right? The, the wealth is directly causing the test scores here, and unless there's something like near universal bribery going on with the ACT uh, or with with the, the, the you know the, the the organization that writes the the test and administers the test, then household income is not going to be the proximate cause of of the test performance here, right? And so it's not. Uh, Again, like if everybody's you know bribing for scores, well, then it would make sense why people with more money are getting higher scores. That's probably not what's going on. Um, and so again, the money is not a proximal cause. Uh, however, we might be able to say that it's a distal cause. It is the amount of household wealth might cause something else, right? That causes something else that causes the high test scores or something like that. So some fee, some some factors there. It, it, it's also possible some third factor, right? That there might be underlying causation going on here. Uh, it's possible that some other factor causes both the wealth and the test performance. So there might be no direct causal link between wealth and SAT scores, but there might be something that causes the wealth and that causes the test scores that's the same thing. And so the, and in fact, the author of this article that the, that this graph comes from suggests that it's genetics actually that cause both of the high exam performance and the wealth on the theory that uh, if you're sort of genetically smarter, then you're going to be more wealthy and score better on the tests. And so there's again, no direct causal result here. I'm pretty skeptical about that, actually. Uh, in order for that to be the correct uh, uh, explanation, uh, there would be a lot of other things that would also have to be true that sort of don't look like they are. Uh, so, for example, the genetics hypothesis, the, the, the idea that it's the genetics that's causing both the wealth and the high test scores, you would have to establish first that genes actually do cause intelligence. And we'll take a look at that claim. You'd have to establish that intelligence causes good test performance, right? You have to take a look at that claim. Again, it sounds plausible, but it, you know we have to you have to check. Um, and either, right, one of these two things has to be either intelligence is what ca causes wealth, or good test performance causes wealth, right? Uh, and so uh, you know, all, again, all of that would have to be established before this idea that it's genetics being the ultimate cause here um, is uh, could could be plausible. So let's take a look at some of those claims. So first off, is intelligence genetic? The answer, uh, according to a tremendous amount of scientific research that's been done over a long period of time, is sorta. 
Uh, so one one uh, good summary of that uh, comes from I, I've pulled from this article from Scientific American uh, written by uh, Robert Plowman. The, he says this. He says genes account for about half of all differences in intelligence among people. Uh, so that means half of it is not caused by genetic differences, which provide strong support for the importance of environmental factors. This estimate of 50% res reflects the results of twin studies, adoption studies, and DNA studies, right? So again, a, a, a lot of results here. And so uh, sort of partly, right? So intelligence is at least partly genetically uh, influenced, right? So again, roughly half it's the, is the, the scientific consensus at this point in time. And so, uh, does intelligence cause higher test scores? Okay, well, the answer again is sorta, right? Um, a, a study from King's College of London reveals a whole set of heritable traits that appear to be correlated with test scores. Uh, and intelligence is, is one of them, but it is only one of them, and it's not really the biggest. Um, and so if you want some related evidence on the on, on performance, right, uh, and intelligence, uh, a lot of studies have found have studied a link between intelligence and say, for example, good chess playing, which is, you know, uh, sort of related. Um, and they have tended to find intelligence to be a predictor of good chess performance really only at the beginner level. Um, so that means that generally people with higher intelligence tend to pick up the game a little faster, uh, but that once you go up the scale, uh, there are other factors that tend to, um, that, uh, that, that tend to be more explanatory of success. Um, you know, such as uh, how hard you work at it, for example. Uh, there's, you know, those things, those things matter a lot. Um, so, uh, you know, again, intelligence may, may matter in the early stages of a process like this, but it can be overridden by other kinds of, of heritable factors. So then, of course, the question, uh, does intelligence cause wealth? Okay, and uh, this one's pretty solid. No, um, uh, you know the whole the whole idea that just like intelligent people are somehow going to be economically successful is um, uh, pure fantasy, uh, and there's there's uh, no evidence of that at all. In fact, quite a lot of evidence to the contrary. Um, so if you take a look at um, uh, an article uh, that I've linked here, um, it's a, a you know again a, a peer reviewed uh, article here. Uh, this one studies uh, you know the relationship between intelligence and uh, investment. Right. That is, if you're, you're like an investor buying and selling stocks and other sort of financial products, um, uh, you know, again, some. The idea might be that you would, you know, if you were really smart, you'd be able to do that or uh, anyway, really intelligent, then you'd be able to do that better than anybody else. And that's um, not really the case. So uh, just a quote from the article, it says this finding suggests that chance that is luck rather than differential investment talent is the dominant factor in the process of wealth accumulation by financial investment. Uh, that is those who are uh, uh, most successful as financial investors are rather luckier than they are smart. Uh, so uh, uh, another bit of evidence here, um, that's another quote here. Nobel Prize winning economist James Heckman likes to ask people how great a role innate intelligence plays in financial success, like how much the difference between my income and yours, for example, is based on our relative IQs. His research reveals something else entirely, and uh, he, he estimates that in, innate intelligence plays at best a 1% to 2% role in a child's future uh, financial success in this case. Uh, and then, of course, uh, another study linked here uh, uh, quoted says this, it says, in particular, we show that if it is true that some degree of talent is necessary to be successful in life, almost never the most talented people reach the highest peaks of success, being overtaken by mediocre but sensibly luckier individuals, right? So again, this is a, a study of, 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 you know, success and, and certain sort of innate features. And uh, again, uh, fortune plays a, a large role in that sort of thing, much larger than you would uh, generally expect. Um, this is one of these things where people like to see causes in, in a lot of places where there aren't any. Uh, and so they like to say, oh, well, if somebody is successful in some way, there must be something about them that has caused it. Uh, and in many cases, it's not, that's not true. In many cases, it really is just good luck. Um, and, uh, you know, sort of random chance. Uh, but, uh, but there you go. So, uh, again, clearly we, there, we, have, we, have, we have no reason to suspect that uh, intelligence actually causes wealth in any reliable way. And so here we are, right back at this original correlation. Um, uh, you know, the, again, the genetics hypothesis doesn't look that great. Um, and so what we want to do is maybe consider possible reversed causation. Uh, that is, instead of a lack of academic achievement causing poverty, could not poverty cause a lack of academic achievement? 
right? And so another way to put that is, might it not be the case that those who are poorer do not reach their genetic potential because of their poverty instead of simply lacking potential to begin with, right? The idea is that um, if you have, you know, face all kinds of disadvantages, uh, that uh, those things might stack up over time and uh, might, might uh, you know, might show in a performance number like these test scores here uh, without uh, actually, you know, really saying anything substantive about who has these test scores or any of their innate features. Um, and, and I will, I'll, I'll say this, I'll add this, is that one thing I do know, I have sort of personal experience with this one, is that uh, test prep, that is, if you, um, you know, like, if you pay somebody to to you know help you with strategies for taking these kinds of standardized tests, uh, they they it really does work. I I myself worked you know for a time in grad school as one of my side gigs, uh, as as somebody who taught test prep uh, uh, on these kinds of tests, uh, and. Uh, I mean, everybody, everybody I worked with increased their scores. It was, it's, and, and it's, I don't think that was anything special about me, right? I was just, I just followed the program. Uh, but I, I also do know that that kind of work is fairly expensive and uh, not everybody can afford that. And so I think that, I, I don't know that that's going to like explain the entire run of, of stuff here, but I think the idea is that if you have more money and you can throw more money at the problem, you can do more of those kinds of things that, that, that absolutely, in fact, work. So test prep only being one of those things, right? And uh, and I think that that probably works not just with tests, but with all kinds of things in life. And so, um, if again, if you have more money, you're more likely to provide your kids with a you know a quiet place to study, uh, maybe a, a a better quality computer, right? A better quality internet access, uh, you know, more books, uh, you know, uh, access to other highly educated people, etc. Like all that sort of stuff. And I think I think all that probably stuff probably adds up um, and so uh, so the idea is then that wealth would be a kind of distal cause of good test performance um, and so the idea is that people from wealthier households would tend to uh, attend more well-funded schools because most schools are funded by property taxes uh, in the United States anyway. Uh, they would probably have more books at home. Uh, they would not necessarily have to enter the workforce early. Um, and so they might have more time uh, to devote just to their studies. Uh, they would not necessarily need part-time jobs outside of school uh, the way that people in, in you know lower income households tend to. Uh, they are more likely to have a computer at home, more likely to have a quiet place to study at home, more likely to have more highly paid teachers, again, because schools are funded by property taxes, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like you can just sort of keep stacking it on. And given all that stuff, uh, you probably shouldn't be surprised at this kind of a correlation here. And so it looks like um, it's not, um, uh, it's, it, it really is pretty clearly the wealth being simply a distal cause of the good test performance uh, and not anything like, you know, innate to any of the students themselves. All right, so given that kind of causal reasoning, I hope you see how complicated and messy causality can be, uh, how tricky it is sometimes to nail down what seems to be causing what. Uh, and now I wanna take a look at some uh, some causal fallacies, some, some ways of going awry, some ways of making mistakes with respect to uh, attributing causation. Uh, and so, I just wanted to have uh, just a basic thing here. Uh, there's there are lots of common beliefs about what causes what that uh, that you know again careful examination has shown not to be the case. Um, and uh, here here's a sampling of them. Uh, so this is one I always heard when I was a kid that eating if you eat before you go swimming, um, it's you're going to get a cramp and that's dangerous or something like that. So you have to wait a certain amount of time after you eat something before you can go swimming. This was uh, I constantly heard this. Uh, Again, careful studies have found that this is not in fact the case. Eating before swimming does not cause cramps, uh, just like eating before any other kind of exercise does not cause cramps. Um, although there is a correlation between drinking alcohol and drowning, although that shouldn't necessarily be that surprising. Uh, colds, right? Uh, that is, that is uh, sicknesses caused by uh, a variety of different viruses that we just call cold. Uh, they're not caused by the weather, they're caused by microbes. Uh, uh, spicy food does not cause ulcers. Uh, it may irritate ulcers if you have them, it, it does not cause them. Um, metal does not break your microwave. It does uh, sort of ruin the finish of the metal and it does create sparks and uh, you know heat and everything, but it does not actually harm the cyclotron on your microwave, right? Uh, again, that's not a reason to just go ahead and put metal in the microwave, but 
uh, among the reasons uh, not to put metal in the microwave is not that it will break the microwave. Uh, red things do not make bulls angry. Okay, They don't have the same kind of color vision as you or I do. Usually the reason a bull is mad in a bullfight is because it's been, you know, stabbed and has little, you know, sort of metal bits digging into its flanks. And, you know, they do things to irritate the bull by sort of causing it pain and frustration. Um, that's that's why bulls and bullfights are angry. It doesn't really have anything to do with the, the red. Uh, and uh, cameras, right, security cameras of various kinds uh, uh, do not actually reduce crime. Uh, uh, there's been, you know, I've got a large scale studies on this one, uh, you know, places where cameras have gone in and, you know, largely in order to prevent crime, they don't tend to reduce crime. They do actually make it easier to, they, they make a conviction and an apprehension of the guilty party more likely, but they don't actually tend to reduce the crime. Um, you know, and again, we could go on, uh, but, uh, uh, I wanted to spend a little more time on, um, uh, on an even more common one and illustrate in some sense how, um, uh, how it is that some of our, our false ideas about causation uh, can seem to take such a strong hold. Uh, because one of the things that, that is very natural for human beings to do is, is we like to see patterns. We like to see causation where there is none. Um, and that's uh, uh, just a, a really, really common thing. In fact, if you see that something like this image, basically every superstition you've ever heard of uh, is, is largely generated by people sort of seeing causation where there is none, looking at two things that are they're entirely unrelated to each other. Um, and, and just, you know, because one thing happened before another, they're just going to assume uh, that the first thing must have caused the second it's a very powerful impulse uh, but we you have to resist it right a good good critical rational thinker is gonna have to resist that uh, so uh, for example one thing uh, where where uh, we get a, a wrong idea based on uh, mistaking correlation for causation uh, is in this question so so think this right does sugar make kids hyper right uh, that is when you feed baby goats sugar to the, the baby goat. Um, I'm kidding about the baby goats. I just wanted a, an excuse to put goats in pajamas on here because they're adorable, aren't they? Okay, no, no, no. This, this is the sort of thing we mean, right? And so uh, does sh does sugar make, make human children hyper? And of course, everybody who has or has been around children says, oh, absolutely. I've seen it a hundred times, right? And it's like, well, have you? Okay. Um, in fact, uh, this idea is not something that's been sort of universally known. Uh, in fact, if you want to sort of try and trace it back uh, uh, where, where where people got this idea from, it probably comes from this fellow here more than anyone else. Um, this is uh, this is Ben Feingold. He wrote uh, a uh, the Feingold Cookbook for hyperactive children and other and others with problems associated with food additives and uh, salicylates. Uh, so, and essentially, essentially, what this this is 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 a uh, a kind of, of subtractive diet. So here's the thing. It is actually true that some number of individuals react badly to certain kinds of, of food additives and ingredients, and sometimes including refined sugars. Um, but there, that doesn't mean that there's a general connection uh, between, say, for example, sugars and, and hyperactivity. But this is a message that I think a lot of people got uh, that sort of got reported in the media. And, you know, there's... A, Again, after this point, there's something of an assumption uh, that, that sugar must uh, be a, a cause of hyperactivity. It's become a very common idea since then. Uh, and just in case you're confused, this is not, this is Ben F. Feingold, MD, right? Uh, this is not the American grandmaster chess player, uh, Ben Feingold. They're just two different people. You'll notice the, the different spellings of the last name. Um, uh, the uh, Ben Feingold, the, the one on the right anyway, uh, did not, uh, like this Ben Feingold did not write a cookbook about hyperactivity. Activity, etc. He wrote Chess with Ben Feingold, the Smith Moore Gambit Feingold Defense, and Cry Like a Grandmaster. Right, so different person, uh, different spelling of the last name, just in case you were uh, confused about that. All right, so now to the facts. All right, uh, this is uh, you know one particular study uh, that is called Effects of Diets High in Sucrose or Aspartame on the Behavior and Cognitive Performance of Children. Uh, here's the citation for that and, uh, you know, uh, all that stuff. Uh, they, uh, some, some excerpts from the article, uh, that from the study, they said, we conducted a double blind controlled trial. Okay. So that means, remember uh, from our discussion about scientific procedure, double blinding means that neither the test subjects nor the researchers knew who had the sugar and who had the placebo, right? Uh, that is the what they said, uh, they have saccharin, right? This is a sort of fake sugar. It's a, it's no, no calories. It doesn't actually like, you know, um, it's, it's sort of, you know, the diet sort of candy. Um, so the idea was this, they, they, they just got two groups of children. 
uh, normal uh, three to five year olds and and some school age six to, you know that are six to ten year olds that were described by their parents as sensitive to sugar right um, so all of the the children in this study were were all people that their parents thought they were sensitive to sugar the children and their families followed a different diet for each of three consecutive three week periods one of them was high in sucrose with no artificial sweeteners another was low in sucrose and contained aspartame as a sweetener and the third was low in sucrose and contained saccharin as a sweetener all the diets were essentially free of additives artificial food colorings and and preservatives the children's behavior and cognitive performance were evaluated weekly and here's what they found they said that even when intake exceeds typical dietary levels neither sucrose nor aspartame affects children's behavior or cognitive function right so it's a, there's there's really no difference once you double blinded it and looked uh you know without without any sort of bias at, at the uh, at the results uh, another study, right, again, here's your citation. Uh, this one tested 21 boys aged six and a half to 14 who were considered by their parents to have adverse behavioral reactions to dietary sugar loads with standard glucose. So they did a placebo test. It was, again, randomized, double blind, um, and uh, they said observed behavioral ratings and measures of attention and memory showed no consistent or significant change following sugar challenges. Right, that is, they, they could they could just not find any evidence that sugar had any effect on anybody's behavior, even among uh, among people whose parents believed that they had, uh, you know, like sugar sensitivities. Right. Uh, here's another study. Okay, this is uh, again. Here's the citation. Um, and uh, this is uh, actually a meta-analysis. This is what, what's called a study of studies. So this is when a bunch of researchers basically gather together a bunch of things that have uh, studies that have studied the same phenomenon, look at all their methods, look at all their results, and then in, in some sense try and synthesize it out to say, here's what sort of repeated, 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 repeated studies have shown. Um, and uh, this is what the meta-analysis says. They said studies were required to uh, intervene by having the subject consume a known quantity of sugar, use a placebo, blind the subject's parents and research staff, that is double blind everything, and report statistics that could actually be used to compute to compute the, the effect sizes. And here's what they found. They said the meta-analytic synthesis of the studies to date, that is when you put everything together and analyze it, uh, they found that sugar does not affect the behavior or cognitive performance of the children. The strong belief of parents may be due to expectancy and common association. However, a small effect of sugar uh, or effects on subsets of children cannot be ruled out. They're like, yeah, maybe there's a little thing that we can't rule it out, but we just, we just, there's nothing significant. We found, found absolutely nothing in study after study after study. And so, in fact, uh, one of the authors of that meta-analysis, Dr. Woolrich, uh, was uh, interviewed in another article, and here's here's what he said. He said, sugar does not, right, appear to affect behavior in children. Um, instead, parents' expectations of so-called sugar highs appear to color the way that they view their children's behavior. It's easy to see why parents make the link, and this is where uh, we have this uh, some some lessons about causality, right, and about seeing causes where there is none. Sugar is often the main attraction at birthday parties, on Halloween, and other occasions when children are likely to bounce off the walls. But all that energy is due to kids being excited, not from the sugar. Right? If parents believe that sugar affects their children's behavior, uh, quote, their ideas are reinforced by seeing it in those circumstances. Uh, so again, this is a, an example of, of confirmation bias. If you already believe that your um, uh, that your uh, if you already believe that your children are going to react to the sugar, uh, then when they do at certain times, uh, when you know, then then you'll notice the link. Whereas you know every time they have some sugar and then behave more or less normally, you just forget about it, right? So uh, again, confirmation bias has a role here, but also our our willingness to just you know assume uh, that thing, when things are correlated, they must be connected in some way. Yeah, no, it's it's the parties, it's the special occasions that tend to cause the hyperactivity, probably not the sugar, right? So lots of times when sugar is featured, it's at these occasions where you would expect children to be excited. Um, they'd be excited even without the sugar, right? So, uh, but of course, people don't tend to notice that. And in fact, uh, just uh, even that, that claim, the claim that people are imagining the whole connection, uh, that has been studied, right? Uh, and again, here's the citation, uh, and, and it says uh, said that this study tested the hypothesis that commonly reported negative effects of sugar on children's behavior may be due to parental expectancies. Uh, again, they uh, made a study uh, in which 35 five to seven year old boys who were reported by their mothers to be behaviorally sugar sensitive and their mothers were randomly assigned to experimental and control groups. Okay, again, 
double blind, right? All the children actually in this case received the placebo, right? So like basically the the, the mothers didn't know who was getting the placebo, the placebo and who wasn't because they all were, right? Mothers in the sugar expectancy condition rated their children as significantly more hyperactive, right? That is the expectancy effect was much stronger for uh, what they call cognitively rigid mothers. That is people who don't, you know, non-critical thinkers. That's a, a fancy word for that. So in any case, uh, they, they you can even test that. You can just like, you know, say, hey, we're giving your kid sugar and tell if tell me if you think they get more hyper and you're not giving any of them sugar and uh, then you know all the ones that you told that you were giving them sugar they all, all thought their kids were hyper because they, just, they imagined it right they um, they interpreted uh, the ambiguous evidence of the kids behavior um, as evidence that confirmed something they already thought in this case they thought that uh, sugar would cause uh, hyperactivity and it, it simply doesn't um, it, uh, they imagined it um, and and people imagine things all the time um, so that's uh, very important to keep in mind. Uh, and again, if you're thinking, gosh, how, how silly and irrational these people are, I would never make such a mistake, right? Well, that's a kind of self-serving bias all in itself um, to think that uh, various kinds of cognitive problems don't, don't apply to you, but would apply to everybody else. Uh, so in any case, the, yeah, there's a, there's a, uh, there's an example, right, of uh, how, how people do tend to just imagine causality. Okay. All right. Last example I wanted to take a look at is a, a kind of, again, a, a review. We talked about this one uh, previously in the course, the uh, Texas Sharpshooter Procedure. And of course, uh, the Texas Sharpshooter Procedure is where somebody like, you know, shoots a bunch of holes in a barn and then somebody, you know, then later goes and sort of draws bullseyes around them, right? Uh, and that's a kind of analogy uh, for the way that, uh, for one way to misinterpret data or to read causality where there is none. Um, and so uh, the, an example of, of that in action is a, Again, this is a common belief even even today. Uh, people oftentimes believe that power lines uh, or living near power lines or under power lines uh, had something to do with uh, leukemia or other kinds of cancers. Uh, but in general, uh, the, that's the result of the Texas sharpshooter fallacy. And uh, again, this one goes back largely to um, uh, something that happened in Sweden a number of years ago. And uh, some people got concerned, okay, about living near some power lines. And so what the Swedish government did was they looked at lots of neighborhoods to figure out the rates of like just hundreds of different ailments, right, to see if the power lines had any correlation. And what they found was they found in some places, in some neighborhoods, a higher than expected rate of leukemia, right, in some neighborhoods that had a lot of power lines. And this might sound like you know a, a, an important thing to do except that you have to make sure that you're not overfitting your data you have to make sure that you're not just sort of you know throwing out a lot of random stuff and then and then painting in the bullseyes later okay uh, so the trouble is that if you look at the incidence of such a large number of ailments you are bound to see at least some clusters somewhere and just painting a bullseye around them as if uh, it just doesn't make them meaningful they would be meaningful if you could predict beforehand Right. If you could say, OK, these neighborhoods, because they you know, have more power lines, should have more prevalence of this condition. Then you look at the data and see if that's actually borne out. Then you're actually aiming at a target and hitting it. But if you're just looking at like, OK, let's look at, you know, 100 different conditions uh, all across the map and see if we see any clusters. Right. That's that's going to lead you astray. That will lead you to believing that there's causation uh, where there may be none. Right. And so the thing is that other neighborhoods. Uh, with power lines had lower than expected rates of leukemia, but that of course doesn't mean that the power lines protected them from leukemia either. Um, it's just one of those things where uh, data na naturally clusters sometimes. Uh, this uh, fits the, the clustering illusion that we talked about again earlier in the course. No laboratory test has observed any strong relationship between proximity to power lines and leukemia or any other cancer. All right, so th these are ways, right, that sometimes uh, the uh, 
the 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 human mind uh which is again a, a wonderful tool it's uh it, it, it's a it's a remarkable thing uh but it's not perfect and we have to know the ways in which we're likely to be misled uh, otherwise we're we'll, we'll just be you know again we'll be misled and, and won't know it and so uh again one thing that that humans do is they like to see causality where there may be none uh, and causality is tricky, right? You should, uh, and, and, and it's very easy to think of it in too simplistic a way. Um, and so uh, just in summary, uh, make sure to consider uh, consider possible reversed causation anytime time two things are correlated. Consider possible underlying causation. Mm -hmm. uh, think about how far down the chain certain causes might be, right? You might say that one thing is a very sort of distal cause for something else, might be involved in a causal chain. Um, and uh, don't assume that just because one thing comes before another that the first thing must have caused the second. Uh, uh, you know, don't assume that uh, something that seems like they ought to be related must actually be related, right? Because sometimes when you look carefully, you'll find that that isn't the case. Um, and, uh, you know, don't look at too wide a field of data and just look for any kind of sort of meaningfulish looking cluster because um, all of those clusters are going to look a lot more meaningful uh, than they than they generally are. It's a, again, that's a way of making a very particular kind of mistake. And so those are some some tips on how to avoid uh, spurious correlation. That is uh, this notion that things uh, are seem to be related to each other it means they must actually be. Uh, they aren't always. Um, and uh, when they are related, they might be related in a very complex and, and uh, hard to uh, discover kind of a way. So causality can get messy, but you you know you can do you can do better than just what you would naturally do just walking around on autopilot.